Hello, Kim 2, and welcome to Chapter 3, All About Stoichiometry. Um, this chapter is actually labeled Mass Relations and Stoichiometry. We're going to go a little outside of the realm of just mass relations. But the question that usually comes up is, what is stoichiometry? Stoichiometry is that quantification in chemistry, whereas we can figure out how much stuff do we need, how much can be made, um, some quantity, some amount of materials to start with, to end with, how much theoretical, blah, blah, blah. It's all about how much of the materials during a chemical reaction. That's what stoichiometry is. Now, this chapter has three um, different sections. Um, the section we're going to do today is simply 3.1, 3 the mole. Then uh, section 3.2 is mass relations with formula. So again, we're focusing solely on what's happening with the formula. And then finally, what we're going to do is we're going to break down to quite a few videos, all the different relationships within um, chemical reactions. So this video series is actually going to be broken into seven videos. Um, this one's the mole. We'll do that one first. And then we follow with one on mass relations and chemical formulas for section two. And then section three, um, your chapter, your textbook does a very, very brief quick, quick, quick analysis of the relationships within reactions. I'm going to break it down into five separate videos to try to make sure we are very thorough. This is this stoichiometry is probably the most important concept in chemistry as far as um, quantification and understanding the mathematics. So we're going to have mass to mass relationships, quantity to quantity relationships, which is what if you, you can't measure mass. Um, talk about what are limiting reactants and how to determine percent yield. And then we're going to have a dive into a couple applications. One is just general applications of stoic, and we'll do a few problems um, revolving around what, um, how this stoichiometry concept can be used. And then last thing we're going to do is focus on probably one of the most common stoichiometric analyses, and that's called a combustion analysis. So that's where we're going with these series of videos. So we're going to spend a little bit of time on this. Both chapter three and chapter four both revolve around stoichiometry. So we're going to spend a lot of time um, for the next couple few weeks just focusing on this concept of quantification of materials. So section one is the mole. So we're going to, in this video, talk about what is the molar mass and then how to relate moles to mass and to other things. Um, then we're also going to talk about moles in solution, talk about this concept called molarity. So what is the mole? So the mole, by definition, is the chemist's version of counting, the counting unit. And sometimes just simply referred to as the chemist dozen. When you go to Dunkin', it used to be called Dunkin' Donuts. When you go to Dunkin', you go up there and you do not say, can I have 12 donuts? You go in there, you say, I'd like to have a dozen donuts. Um, that's because at a donut shop or a bakery, they understand that their term for 12 is a dozen. In chemistry, we also have a number that designates a name that designates a number and that is the mole by definition a mole is exactly how many atoms are going to be in exactly 12 grams of carbon 12 and amadeo avogadro determined that that number was 6.022 times 10 to 23rd now you should recognize that number from chapter Yes, chapter one, we address this idea of the number of atoms in a gram, it's a, the, a periodic table gram of a substance. Well, this is where that number comes from. It's Avogadro's number. It is the number of particles that are in this counting unit called the mole. So we say that there's a number of particles where we count in particles, we count atoms, we count molecules, or we count what are called formula units. The difference between a molecule and a formula unit is a molecule, when you talk about a molecule, is a covalent mole, covalent term. So a covalent compound is a molecule. An ionic compound is a for, it should be referred to as a um, formula unit. Really, we're going to keep just refer to them as particles and look for vocabulary issues. So if you see the word atom, molecule, or formula unit, you should think particle. So let's see how we use Avogadro's number. So if I wanted to figure out how many atoms are in 6.25 moles of zinc, what I'm going to do is 
um, take my 0 0.625 moles of zinc. Now I'm going to use my dimensional analysis. Remember, we used that in the first chapter to say that I know that there are Avogadro's number 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of zinc in a mole of zinc. And then I do the math. 0. 0.625 times 6.022 times 10 to the 20, 23rd. And I get to the appropriate number of sig figs, um, 3.76 times 10 to 23rd atoms of zinc. Okay, a way to go from moles to atoms. What if we want to go from, sorry, from atoms to moles? What if we want to go from molecules to moles? Go the opposite. Well, now we're going to start with what's given to us, six, 9.6, look at that save, times 10 to 24th molecules of CO2. And again, using the same conversion factor, but this time flip it upside down. Since I want to cancel out the molecules or those particles, I'm going to put the number on the bottom. And then put the mole on top. That's going to allow my molecules to cancel. And again, do the math. Six point, sorry, 9.63 times 10 to the 24th divided by 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. And if I use the calculator right, I get that there are to three sig figs because there's three there. There's 16.0 moles of carbon dioxide. So we have the ability to go between moles and molecules. Now, the reality is the mole is a concept that helps us not use actual numbers of particles. We're going to count almost exclusively in numbers of moles. So we have this conversion factor. We know that there's a relationship between moles and particles, and we need to use Avogadro's number to go between the two. Well, when we were in that earlier chapter, we were talking about what the heck a mole is and what the heck that Avogadro's number was. We realized that on the periodic table, the number that's on the periodic table represents the number of grams in 6.022 times 10 to 23rd, but which now we know to be a mole of that substance. So we have relationships. We have ratios, grams per mole. We also, and this is something that showed up just very, very briefly on the homework, um, are able to expand that outside of the elements and say, well, wait a second. If I have the molecule of water, in a molecule of water, I have two hydrogens and one oxygen. So how about I take two times the atomic mass of hydrogen and add to it one times the atomic mass of oxygen. And if I add those up, I'm going to get the molar mass or the molecular mass of water. Same thing can hold true for formulas. Formulas are nothing more than compounds. The concept is exactly the same. All we're focusing on is whether or not you're talking about a, a ionic compound or a covalent compound. The process is the same. So potassium sulfide, potassium sulfide has two potassiums and one sulfur. So we're going to take two times the potassium number off your periodic table, one times the um, sulfur number off your periodic table, add them together, and get an atomic, a, what's called a formula mass for um, potassium sulfide. We're going to make life a little bit easier. We're just going to refer to it as molar mass. So if we're talking about atomic mass or formula mass or molecular mass, we're going to lump that all together under a term that we're going to refer to as simply molar mass. And the molar mass rep is a conversion factor that allows us to go between something we can measure physically, mass, and moles, counting things. And if you go back to what we were doing in the earlier chapters with Avogadro's number, we're just kicking Avogadro's number out of the equation. So now we have a way to go from a measurable quantity, how much did I weigh, put on the balance, versus how many moles, how many units of that material are there. So let's see how we use it. So if I want to know how many moles are in 
96, 69.5 grams of zinc chloride, I'm going to start by saying I got 39.5 grams of zinc chloride. And from chem chapter two, we should know the formula for zinc chloride is ZnCl2. And then I'm using a textbook um, periodic table. I'm not using the periodic table you guys have in, in class, so the numbers might be slightly different, but we're going to go with it. I get 35.453 times 2 plus zinc 65.39. And I get, again, with the periodic table that I have, with the significant figures I have, which is two digits past the decimal, is that I have a 136.30 grams of zinc chloride for every mole of zinc chloride. So I do the math there, 39.5 divided by 136.3, and I get to three significant digits that when I measure out my 39.5 grams of zinc chloride, I actually have 0 0.290 moles of zinc chloride. So I'm able to count the number of particles that are in my sample. What if I want to go the other way? Well, just as easy. If I had 9.25 moles of oxygen, oxygen is O2. Okay, oxygen is one of those Brinkelhoffs. Okay, think back to Chem 1, Brinkelhoff, B R I N C L H O F. All of these have a subscript of 2 when they're written as individual elements. So oxygen is O2. Oxygen's atomic mass, so molecular mass, happens to be 31.9988. Why I know that, I've used oxygen way too often in examples, and I just put it on the wrong side. I realized that because I went to cross things out, and that didn't work. So I'm going to go ahead and erase it because I made a mistake. So I'm going to use my eraser, and I'm going to try to get rid of all that. See, if you use dimensional analysis, I want to say that that was on purpose, but it wasn't. If you use dimensional analysis, you can tell when you make a mistake. I need to have moles in the bottom. So I want to do 31.9988 grams of O2 in the top so that moles of O2 can be in the bottom. Cancel it out. So in order to start, solve this one, I'm going to say 9.25 times 31.9988. And again, the three significant digits, I get 296 grams of O2. So if I wanted to measure at 9.25 moles of oxygen gas, I would have to weigh out 31.9988 grams of oxygen. What if I want to know the number of particles, but I have a mass or vice versa? Well, there you're actually going to have to do two steps. So if I look up and I say I got 9.68 times 10 to 23rd atoms of lead. There's no bridge between atoms and particles. Okay, I look back at my, my table that I had here. There's no bridge here. There's no direct line between mass and particles. But I want to solve for particles. I want to solve for mass from particles. So what I need to do is do two steps. I'm going to go from atoms to moles first. Oops. There we go. Get back. There we go. Atoms to moles first, 6.022 times 10 to 23rd. Atoms of lead per mole of lead. And then I'm going to use the atomic mass of lead, which is 207.2 grams of lead per mole of lead. Atoms cancel, moles cancel. I'm left with grams. I do the math. I get 6.98 times 10 to the 26. That should be a 26 there. Or I got to three. I don't know. I guess I was still stuck in Avogadro's number world divided by 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, 
times 207.2, and I find in order to have that number of atoms of lead, I need 333,000 grams of lead. Whoa, that's a big chunk of lead. Okay. And what if I wanted to go the other way? What if I wanted to go from grams to formula units? Well, it's the same process. You're going to have to take two steps. I start with my 7.25 grams of sodium chloride. And the first thing I need to do is determine the molar mass of sodium chloride. So the periodic table I have has sodium at 22.989770 and chlorine at 35.453. Add those together. I get the molar mass of sodium chloride to be 58.443 grams per mole for NaCl. And then I need to use Avogadro's number. I'm going to use 6.022 times 10 to 23 formula units per mole. Moles cancel. Grams cancel, and I'm talking about how many formula units do I have. So I'm going to take 7.25 divided by 58.443 times 6.02 times 10 to the 20. Oops, back, back, back. 2, 2 times 10 to the 23rd. And I get, if I use the calculator right, that there are 7.47 times 10 to the 22nd formula units of sodium chloride. Okay, so you're able to go from mass to mole, from mole to particles, or between particles and mass using Avogadro's number and the molar mass. Well, we saw one, already saw one example here that was kind of weird, and that was that oxygen example. I asked you to said, well, how much mass would you need for the oxygen? Well, how the heck do you measure mass of oxygen? Oxygen is a gas. So for gases, we're going to use a different conversion factor, one that is a little more convenient. And we're going to use the fact that um, gases, <coughs> sorry, all occupy the same amount of volume as long as they're at the same temperature and pressure. So in order to standardize things in this chapter, in two chapters, we're going to change this. We're going to go over and talk about gas laws and gases at different temperatures and pressures. But for this chapter, what we're going to do is look at gases at STP. And STP stands for Standard Temperature and Pressure. At zero degrees Celsius, freezing point of water. At one atmosphere, that's at sea level. What would be the volume of the gas at STP? Volume is much easier way to measure the amount of gas than to use mass, especially if the gas is lighter than air, in which case it would not register anything on a typical balance. So what we're going to do is recognize that no matter what the gas is, and I got to say this, as long as the gas is a gas at STP, this will not work. This number will not work for, since for steam. Steam is liquid water. At zero degrees Celsius and one atmosphere, water is just starting to be a solid. So this conversion factor will not work unless the substance is a gas at STP. So what's the conversion factor? Well, the conversion factor is that one mole of a gas will occupy a volume of 22.4 decimeters cubed. Decimeter cubed is not a unit you're used to using. So what we're going to use is what is much more convenient. A decimeter cubed has been defined as a liter. So now we have a conversion factor that allows us to measure the volume of a gas and compare it to how many particles exist in that gas. So we have a conversion factor of 22.4, and we have the third leg associated with our table. We have, if it's a gas at STP, and again, we're going to branch out off of STP 
in a couple chapters, but right now for this chapter and next, if it's a gas, we're only going to focus at STP, then we can use 22.4 liters per mole as being our conversion factor. So let's look at an example. What is the volume at STP of 3.59 moles of carbon dioxide? So we're going to look at, come on, there it is. We're going to look at 3.59 moles of CO2. And we just said that all gases at STP are going to have a volume of 22.4 liters for every mole. So 3.59 times 22.4, and I get to three sig figs that my volume of this gas is 80.4 liters. I would have 80.4 liters of carbon dioxide. So I could measure the amount of gas using the volume. I could measure the mass or I could measure the number of particles. Well, let's go back to that, that example earlier, a similar example. What if I had a gas and I want to know how much mass was there? Now, hydrogen is definitely lighter than air. Hydrogen is lighter than air. So hydrogen, if I were to put it into a balloon or container, would be lighter than air. It would not register a mass very easily. But I can measure the volume of hydrogen. I can put it into a balloon and measure the volume of the balloon and be good. So if I wanted to, I could go from liters to moles and then go from moles to mass. And that's what I'm going to do. 6.89 liters at 22 four liters per mole times hydrogen gas let's see 1.00794 times two okay i almost wrote that down but it was afraid to 01588 grams per mole <coughs> and 6.89 divided by 22.4 times 2.01588 and i get that the volume or the mass of that gas, that six liters, 6.89 liters of gas, is only 0 0.620 grams. Not very much. Okay, so that's the way to get around and to focus on things that are either solids and you can measure, gases you can measure. The last possible scenario, also liquids will work under solids, under um, mass also. The last possible scenario is what if we have a solution? Okay, a solution. Well, there we're going to use a concept called molarity. And I'm going to introduce molarity here as part of the this particular chapter. But next chapter, chapter four, we're going to use molarity like crazy. We're going to do a whole lot of molarity calculations and how to use molarity. This next chapter, chapter four, is all about aqueous stoichiometry. But where does um, the mole in a solution come into play? Well, we're going to measure the concentration. Concentration tells you how many molecules are in the solution. We're going to measure the how many molecules in moles. So tells you how many moles of the solute. Solute is the thing that's being dissolved, are in the liter of solution. And sometimes we'll use this convention of using the square brackets as a shorthand of saying molar concentration. Okay. So if I take 1.2 moles of some substance and I dissolve it in enough water to make 2.5 liters of solution, my stuff is going to have a 0.48 moles per liter concentration. And I, we're just going to use the capital M to indicate moles per liter. Now, one of the things about measuring out or, or making a solution that is kind of this, the first time I'll introduce this idea, is that it's a little complicated in how molar solutions have to be created. In order to create a certain concentration of molar solution, you have to first put either some water in the flask that's not full or the solid and then dissolve it. And then once it's dissolved, then you can measure it up to a mark that designates here I have exactly one liter in this case of the solution. You're going to add the water after. You're not going to take a liter of water and add a solid to it because then that volume is going to increase by the amount of solid you added. So you always put the solid in first, get it to dissolve, and then bring it up to volume. Kind of a minor nuance, but the idea is you're talking about volume of solution, not volume of the uh, material. So let's talk about how you would um, do this. 
It says, I have a bottle that has 75 milliliters of nitric acid. And on its label, it says 6.0 moles, molar solution. I wonder how many moles are in that bottle. Well, you know that molarity is equal to moles per liter. So I know the volume. I know the molarity. So I can solve for the number of moles. So how are we going to do this? Well, we know we need to figure out the moles. We have to take our 75 mils. And since molarity is moles per liter, we have to change our volume from milliliters into liters by using our 1,000 milliliters in the liter. That makes milliliters cancel. And then our six molar solution, 6.0 M, is the same as saying 6.0 moles for every one liter of solution. We don't have a liter solution, but that's our ratio. Liters cancel. And then we do the math and we find out we have in that amount of material 0.45 moles of nitric acid. One way to use this as another conversion factor. This is just another conversion factor. Okay. Last idea, talking about how to deal with dissolving of solids. So when an ionic solid dissolves, an ionic solid is going to dissolve. It's going to dissolve and separate into its ions. So if I take magnesium chloride and I were to put it into some water, if it were to dissolve, and we'll talk in the next chapter what they do and when they don't, but when they do dissolve, it's going to break into magnesiums and chlorines. And since there are two chlorines for every one magnesium, we're going to have two chloride, chlorides in solution for every um, one magnesium chloride we started with. So the molarity of the magnesium would be the same as the molarity of the magnesium chloride. But the molarity of the chloride ions when they're dissolved is going to be two times as much because there are two ions. And if you wanted to, for some reason, were asked for the total concentration of all the ions, that would be three because that's two plus the one. So let's look at an example. Got potassium dichromate. And the formula for potassium dichromate is K2Cr2O7. So the ions are K and chromate. There's going to be two Ks and only one chromate. I have a flask that has 125 milliliters of this substance. And the solution is labeled at 0.145 molar of potassium chromate. The question is, what's the molarity of each ion? What's the molarity of the potassium? And what's the molarity of the chromate? So since we have K2Cr2O7, I know for potassium, it's going to be two times because there's two potassiums in every potassium dichromate. So the concentration of the potassium would be 0.290. For the chromate, well, that's a little simpler because there's only one chromate in a potassium dichromate. So that's going to be the same concentration. So that's the end of the first video. Um, talking about all the things you can do using the mole. You can use the molar mass to go between mass and moles. You can use Avogadro's number to go from particles to moles. You can use the molar volume of a gas, 22.4 liters per mole, to go between volume of a gas at STP and moles. And then finally, if you have an aqueous solution, you can go from volume of the solution, not a gas, to the moles. They're all conversion factors that allow you to interrelate with the moles. Um, next video, we're going to branch this out a little bit further and start talking about how the amounts of the elements in a substance can give you the formula. So until next time, um, I will see you in class during synchronous time. But until then, toodles.